let's get started with our conversation, with our discussion in light of that. And I'll begin by introducing the speakers. On the left, we have um, Julian Wheatland, who was COO and CFO of SCL during the period of its growth until 2018, when he took over as acting CEO of the Cambridge Analytica <coughs> Group in order to close down its operations. Prior to SEL, Julian has 20 years of experience commercialising technology, having acted as investor, consultant and director for numerous early and mid-stage tech companies. Julian has become an advocate for a fresh approach to data privacy and the management of organisations storing and utilising personal data. He argues for greater emphasis to be placed on transparent and ethical corporate governance, which can keep pace with technology developments without inhibiting innovation. Julian now serves as an advisor to corporate clients on data management issues and speaks publicly on how to avoid becoming the next Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> um, our second speaker this evening is another Julian, Dr. Julian Huffett, who is an academic and a politician. Originally a bioscientist, he held a university lectureship here at the Cavendish working on DNA structure and function. He served as Member of Parliament for Cambridge 2010 to 2015 and was particularly noted for his work on technology and surveillance, winning the title of ISPA Internet Hero of the Year 2013 for killing off the Communications Data Bill, known as the Snoopers Charter. He is now Director of the Intellectual Forum at Jesus College Cambridge, an interdisciplinary centre aimed to get people thinking and talking about important issues. And via Skype, I think he's still there. You can't. Okay, well, I'll introduce him anyway, and hopefully he'll be back. Um, we have Paul Hilda, who you also met during the film, um, who is the founder and CEO of Data Praxis EU, which is described as Data for Good. He's the co founder of Crowdpack, Facebook Breakup, 38 Degrees, Open Democracy, and is <coughs> formerly part of uh, Change.org. So, um, We'll get started and hopefully he'll be able to rejoin us. First of all, we wanted to give our panel a chance to just more generally react to the film. Um, and I guess we could begin with that with um, Julian Wheatland. So, yeah, what are your feelings on the representation of, of the events that are portrayed in the film? Um, uh, so I think, I think the film is quite compelling viewing um, and it provides a, um, a riveting... Um, uh, exposure to a number of interesting characters um, uh, that were involved in Cambridge Analytica and the events of 2016, <coughs> excuse me, 2017, 2018. Um, what I think it does is it raises a lot of questions. But what I think it doesn't do is it doesn't get very close to providing many answers. Um, and in fact, I think it raises questions in quite a um, um, uh, quite a hyped up way which is probably not a bad thing um, if what we want to do is get a conversation started and get a discussion started um, and, and I think that conversation is starting um, but we, we, we need to move on from uh, the hyperbole and we need to move on from the outrage and we need to move on to talking about what do we do about this now how do we manage it because you know, one thing I can tell you is Cambridge Analytica was not alone. It did have the, um, uh, uh, the honour of giving its name to the Cambridge Analytica scandal and probably will be remembered uh, forever and a day for that. But actually it's one of thousands of companies doing data analytics on personal data um, uh, and targeting of digital ads uh, in the advertising industry <clears throat> and in the political arena and so if we think that uh, Cambridge Analytica is gone and therefore the problem is solved we've, we've really missed the point um, and so we now need to move the conversation on and I think that, that what this film does <coughs> is it provides a good vehicle for starting the conversation and also provides some insight into the personalities of some of the key people involved Thank okay. you very much. Um, and Julian Huffett, um, I know you said this is your first viewing of the film, so you can give us your very honest 
response? Um, yes, I mean, it, it was fascinating, and it's it would be very confusing having two Julians, and you know, <laughs> having two Ju- more Julians than women is not necessarily an ideal balance, but you know, I, 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 I guess we should work with it. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to see. I've been following issues around privacy in a digital age for the best part of a decade now. Um, so I do quite a lot of stuff about state surveillance, where society has perhaps given, given consent. We're now into issues where, in theory, you gave consent to give this information. Um, although I'm not sure any of us really think you knew what you were doing. There was a survey which found that something like 96% of people said they hadn't read Facebook's full terms and conditions, which to me says that 4% of people are liars whenever you ask them a question. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I suspect not even this audience has actually looked. Um, and these are becoming utterly crucial. The, the defining issues of not just how our democracy works, but how all of society works, is how we, these digital tools evolve. Um, I thought it was fascinating and, and some you know, interesting things for questions. A pro tip, you know, if, if your defence statement is we're not Bond villains, something has gone very wrong before you got to that point. Um, <laughs> Just a few reflections. Um, one is the question that you had there, and it's great to see Snyder being used. I think, unfortunately, one of the problems is, I think it is the fault of quite a lot of different people and organisations, and I wanted to answer yes to almost all of those. Because I think that we had this discussion about whose fault was it. Was it Facebook or Cambridge Analytica? It's both. And we need more rules about it, and, and, and. All of these things um, are hugely wrong, and we have to really tackle them. Um, how do we actually do that? Uh, so I've, I've scribbled down all sorts of things which I might talk about uh, later on if they, if they come up. One simple answer um, is that I would actually go as far as banning micro-targeting. I think that is a fundamental problem. Uh, I have no problem with the idea of targeting information based on the fact that you live in the UK or in London or Cambridge, but when it becomes extremely fine, it makes it much easier for it to become dishonest means conversations, the whole idea of of a public sphere where anybody can have a conversation breaks down because we're all told completely different things. And it's very hard, as you know if you go back on Facebook, to find the thing that you were shown before to say to somebody else, did you see this? It's the opposite of what you were told. Um, And we we can talk about how that might work, what the consequences might be uh, later. But I didn't just want to talk about technology. I also thought one thread of this might be how to think about ethical decisions for yourselves in what you do in a company that you might work for. What, what are the things to think about? Um, so just two, two reflections of things I've been involved in. Um, I had a bit of consultancy for an ed tech um, company, a very interesting company based, based down in Exeter, who really want to do things ethically. And they started saying, how do we make sure we don't get things wrong? And they've put in place various checks to try to get there. I'm not saying it's perfect. One thing they always do is they talk about three tests for anything they're thinking about. One's a parent test. Could we explain to a parent why we did this with their child's education or their child's data or whatever it might be? Are we sure that we could look at that parent in the eye and, and explain it? The second one is the Daily Mail test. Now, the Daily Mail isn't always fair, but are you comfortable that when you have to explain it to them, you know why you're doing it, you can justify it? And the third one is the Select Committee test. When you're grilled at a select committee, can you explain there why you did that and are you happy with it? If you can't do any of those, why are you doing this? So that's just one thing. It's a, it's a nice methodology to think through. And then um, you're looking at me to, to shout out. I'll just be very quick about one last thing. Um, I have um, somebody who was in my team when I was an academic uh, here who now has a job in an organisation which does a range of things, some of which I think we would all agree are extremely good, some of which we would probably all agree are rather more questionable. Um, One of the things I said to her when she took the job was right at the start, write down what your moral limits are. Write them out in hard copy and then remember to go and check periodically. Because otherwise what happens, I think we saw some of this in the film, is you start doing something and you're working with somebody who's just a little bit worse than you thought and then it's a little bit worse. And before you know it, you'll find yourself in in a position where I didn't work with the very, very worst people so it's not that bad. So just maybe two useful things. Thank you. Um, So I think we've got Paul back with us now. Um, So... (laughs) Technology. It's a conspiracy. (laughs) Um, So the first question we were asking um, the panel was a bit of an open comment on whether there's anything that you'd like to say about the way that events were represented in the film. Do you feel that it was an accurate representation or is there anything you'd like to add? I mean, the reality is 
the um, <laughs> how can I put this? Uh, film is all about selecting the edit, to tell the story that you want to tell, and there are a whole bunch of decisions that go into that. Uh, but I think they made a brilliant film. It doesn't tell the whole story. It's not a very important part of the story, or a few very important parts of the story, and it asks the right questions. So I think it's a great film. There's a lot of things I did last year that aren't in the film. Very happy about that. Um, I think it's awesome <laughs> in shoot course. Um, but um, uh, the, the thing that I would highlight, which is just something for all citizens to consider, is that the most effective form of disinformation is partial information. So if you can tell people a partial truth, which makes them look at the world a particular way, uh, then that's a very, very powerful tool for disinformation. At the same time, every truth is partial. So who selects? The graphic question. That's great, thank you. Um, I guess before we move on, Julian and Julian, um, do you have anything that you'd like to add to what Paul said or any, any comment on what each other has said as well? Well, I'd perhaps pick up on something that Paul said about the, 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 you know, the most significant part of disinformation. In many ways, the, the whole Cambridge Analytica <coughs> saga and the interference of you know, foreign actors in elections and the truths and untruths that have been said about what happened and about what, 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 what was being done has had a serious detriment, in my view, to our democracy because it's undermined the confidence in democracy and, I believe, excessively. Um, but the fact it's excessive, that's what we should worry about because I think that, that, that people have got over-concerned about whether or not it's possible to have a free and fair election. Of course we can have a free and fair election. But by telling partial truths and by spreading misinformation about what's gone on, I think that there's been a lot of unfair undermining of democracy. Julian, do you have anything to say to that? Do you think <laughs> that the response is excessive? Um, I mean, I'm tempted to say I thought elections worked a lot better in 2010 than they did in 2015, but um, <laughs> that might be for other reasons. Um, I think part of the thing is that our democratic system in the UK and in many other places is extremely vulnerable. It is and has been manipulated by all sorts of people for a very, very long time. Um, I'm a director of an organisation called the Joseph Rowntree Reform Trust. We were set up in 1904 by Joseph Rowntree of, of Fruit Pastels um, to do things about media control and the purity of elections. And he wrote an amazing memorandum, which I recommend reading, and some of the language is slightly outdated, but a lot of the issues have been problems since 1904. We've had a broken electoral system, we have a funding system which you know, is deeply dubious, we have a system where, astonishingly, people who give a million pounds to a political party tend to be called Lord shortly afterwards. You know, there are all sorts of problems. This is not the only problem, but when you have a fairly vulnerable system, it doesn't take much more. Uh, to put it, push it over the edge. So can we have free and fair elections? Absolutely we can. Does this make it harder for them to happen? Yes, it does. Is there actually... I mean, I, I think there is a more underpinning problem, which is about the huge polarisation that was touched on. And I think that's partly as a result of technology, but it's not just because of that. Thank you. Um, and Paul, do you have oops, anything that you'd like to add to that before we move on? Yeah, I guess I've been somebody who has been concerned about oligarchy power for a long time, since before it was fashionable. Uh, and so from my point of view, I'm not sure that we've had particularly free and fair elections for a while. Do I think we've had democratic elections under situations of difficulty, <coughs> building of unfair militias of power along the way? Yes. So I don't think in that sense there is a, um, a radical step change that happened in uh, 2015 or 2016 or 2017. Um, I, I think it's all on a continuum. Uh, I would like us to have fair and fair elections. My view is, and I said this on a panel recently, with Shoshana Zuboff, who's one of the leading academics looking at the whole area of surveillance capitalism, that's quite a dystopian view of things. 
I think it's in some ways rightly so, but sometimes she overrode it. I said, the reality is, if we live in a world where uh, corporate entities, billionaires, influence operatives, um, like Julian's or colleagues and guys um, like myself and various other people have to give an influence uh, of people in, uh, in elections and, and autonomy is challenged, but, but it's not control. None of these people have control of any. We are still free actors, uh, and I'm somebody who is, as I say in the film, perhaps against some evidence, up to this. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on a little for now, but I'm sure we're going to return to a lot of these ideas later on. Um, so, Julian Huppert, you started talking a bit about the roles of individuals, and that's something I want to linger on a little here. Um, so a lot of people in this audience are physical scientists or data scientists, maybe people who will move into data science in the future. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment a little on, within Cambridge Analytica, what the role of individual young data scientists was, or were, and also maybe how much autonomy they, they had, how much they actually knew about the kind of global scale operations of Cambridge Analytica. Um. Okay, so, uh, so on the technical side of Cambridge Analytica, they were um, uh, split into two main areas. There was data science and data engineering. Um, and so data engineers were those people who would ingest new data sets. Can you hear me now, better, yeah. by the way? Yeah. Uh, ingest new data sets and structure them and clean them up. And then the data science scientists were the people who would analyse them and model them and look for signal in them and look for um, uh, some predictive capability from them. Um, the data science teams were split into two areas. One area was what I'll call blue sky research, um, developing new techniques, uh, investigating new algorithmic um, um, uh, processes and new models. And then on the other side were um, uh, people working <laughs> on client work. <clears throat> so on, on the blue sky side, I'd say that the data scientists had um, a lot of autonomy in terms of what they did and how they structured their work. Uh, they'd, they'd agree their briefs with the chief data officer and they would, um, uh, they would conduct the work in a fairly autonomous way. Um, on the client side, um, uh, data scientists would also work in an autonomous way on a day-to-day -day basis, but they'd be working against a very specific brief and a very specific objective. Um, and they'd work in multidisciplinary teams with psychologists and creative people and usually a, um, an account manager or a project, uh, project director to help coordinate the activities. Uh, they were probably 50% at PhD level and 50% at graduate level um, and they'd come from a broad uh, range of backgrounds uh, such as you know, astrophysics and, <coughs> and biochemistry um, at, at where they'd learned their data, data analytical capabilities and then uh, they came to Cambridge Analytica for us to turn them into uh, to more base um, activities. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so I guess maybe, Paul, um, would you be able to comment on, from, from the work that you've done investigating um, Cambridge Analytica, what do you feel the role of the kind of individual data scientists or data engineers might have been? Do you think that they should have questioned what was happening more or, or not. Um, yeah, do you have any insight into that? <laughs> look, look, it's a good question. Um, I think some of them did, all the way. Uh, some talked to the media as things unfolded, uh, off the record, and many of them talked off the record. Uh, I think, um, look, I, I, I don't want to draw on an exaggerated analogy, but there is an analysis by the academic Zygmunt Bauman um, in a number of books, including a book about modernity and Holocaust, about the extent to which uh, technology <coughs> creates moral distance. And um, it is very possible when human beings become reduced to zeros and ones uh, and archetypes uh, and attributes and data models uh, for a, a moral distance to, to emerge. Now, do I know that 
some of the data scientists were were, were conflicted about what they were doing. Yeah, um, you know, there were people who were reading books like Thomas Davis and having you know existential crises along the way, right? But, but, but they were doing their jobs and they were they were interesting jobs in the same way that making trains run on time is an interesting job um, uh, sometimes. And I, I think um, I'm not saying you know what I'm saying is. Technology is amoral, ultimately. Um, it, it, it really is. You can use technology, it's a double-edged sword. You can use technology for evil or good. Uh, and sometimes you can be approaching that technology in an amoral way, uh, which I think is, uh, is a language that Julian Leland has used himself in the past, and you should speak to this. Um, uh, and uh, ultimately, I, I think that amorality can collapse very rapidly into immorality if you're not careful. Uh, particularly if you're in business with a psychopath, which frankly I think Julian was. Um, and um, again, I wouldn't wish to speak for him or for anybody else, uh, but I think that I would encourage all of the data scientists uh, in that room in Cambridge, which is my own alma mater, to think very carefully about how you use your talents and your, and your skills. Uh, my own view is that the incentives the people in, in data science are overwhelmingly uh, for you to pour your skills into uh, the hedge funds, the algorithmic trading operations, uh, and also the valley and or other kinds of um, basically rent extracting uh, operations, uh, when in fact we have a huge number of social problems to be solved, and data science could be a huge part of solving that. So um, uh, we need to make incentives better for all of you to do. Right <laughs> But uh, that's, yeah, that's a few reflections on the topic. Thank you. Um, Julian, we'll come back to you in a minute. Um, but first, Julian, so you mentioned when you were speaking to um, your colleague about discussing moral limits of individuals. So while we're on the subject, is there anything more that you'd like to say on the responsibility of individuals, in your opinion? Yeah, so I, I think people do have a responsibility to think about what they're working on um, and not just the hopes that they have for it, which is always the easy bit. I really hope that we can do this and it'll all be wonderful. We can communicate, fix the world. Fantastic. But also to think about how things might go wrong. And there are organisations which, which do try to build that in. Um, I, I've seen suggestions that you should always, when you're developing a new um, piece of technology, try and write a Black Mirror episode. What would the Black Mirror episode be where the thing you're working on goes wrong? What would that look like? How terrifying is that? How easy is it to get there? And are there ways of stopping it from happening? Um, so I think there are sort of ways of making sure you think through that. More generally, it's, it's a um, uh, pre-mortems. Why would something go wrong? If you think about that earlier, you might stop doing it or find ways uh, to mitigate it. I think there's also a question about moral need to speak up and it, it's obviously much easier as somebody who hasn't been there to say other people should have done this but we are beginning to see across the tech sector quite a lot of people really taking firm stances uh, we've seen it with google we've seen it with palantir we've seen it with various other companies where people are saying look my company is doing this and i am not up for that happening and actually that that's beginning to be a stronger move and i hope that will continue to be stronger because actually all of these companies are hugely dependent on being able to recruit people. And actually if it becomes hard to recruit because you're doing stuff which people don't like and the good people who have start leaving, that is actually possibly more of a problem than some negative press stories. Thank you. Um, so before we move on to audience questions, um, Julian Wheatland, do you have anything to add on the subject? Yeah, if I, if I may. Um, there's a couple of things. I, I think that there were failings at Cambridge Analytica. Um, I think the, the, the biggest failing was, was a corporate failing, not a failing on behalf of, indivi on behalf of individual technologists. Uh, it's, it, as, as Julian's just said, it, 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 it's hard to point the finger and say someone should have you know, stepped up and thought of this. If, if you're running a company and you don't give people any tools or any structures or any guidance or any, a, a, any boundaries, in which to consider ethical questions of the work that they're doing, then you can't expect them to do it. And it's really easy to be critical. We failed, as do many companies fail, because we had no process, 
we had no, no procedure, we had no guidelines, no framework for questioning the ethics of what we were doing. We spent a lot of effort considering the legality of what we were doing. And once we'd satisf satisfied ourselves that what we were doing would, would, was legal, we thought we'd checked all the boxes. Um, and you know, in hindsight, that was an existential mistake. But, but to, to expect the data scientists or the psychologists to be able to you know, put their hand up and say, this is where we've crossed an invisible line, um, I, I think is not very reasonable. I, I'd like to say one other thing, if I may, which is a, a perspective, and quite an important perspective, uh, about what we were doing. What we were doing was we were improving the efficiency of advertising spend. We were, we, we were not hacking into people's brains, but we were getting some percentage point improvement on when a client, sp on when a client spent a certain amount of money on advertising on the effectiveness of it. Um, and, and, you know, elections are competitive environments. And one side is always trying to get ahead of the other. And this is now the, this is now the coal face of where the competition is going on. And the other thing I'd say is that America is very, very different to the UK and to Europe. In America, there are no data laws. By January the 1st, there'll be one, the first one in, in California. Uh, here, data is quite heavily regulated, and what you can do with data here is heavily restricted versus what you can do with it in the States. And the budgets in elections in the States are huge compared to what gets spent here. So in 2016, the total electoral spend in the United States was $6 billion. Now, we've kicked off the election campaign here and people are talking about the fact that the Liberals have spent £35,000 on social media. Well, big deal. Um, so, I I'm not at all complacent, but when we talk about you know, what's going on here versus what's going on in America, it's two very different landscapes. Thank you. Let's move on to your Slido questions. Um, okay, the one that has been most popular by far. Um, has it ever been possible at any point in history to have a free and fair election? I guess we've touched on this a bit before, but um, I guess the politician in residence first. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a fascinating question, and obviously to some extent it depends what you mean by, by free and fair. Um, I mean, people always talk about Athens and the way they had discussions there, and I'm sure there was influence and control, um, uh, but I suspect it was much closer to free and fair. Um, if I wanted to be technical about it, if people have heard about Arrow's theorem, about how you should run elections, he, he, he set out to use mathematical approaches to say how you, what sort of electoral systems would be fair by various axioms. Uh, and he hoped to reach a conclusion about what we should have. Should it be, well, it wouldn't be first past the post, but what would be a fair system? And unfortunately, he concluded uh, that there, you could only have a fair system uh, in terms of voting if there was exactly one candidate or exactly one elector. Um, so if you have either of those, then you can have free and fair elections. Um, but what you can have is something which is much closer. Um, and I think we are seeing a number of factors which are happening at, at similar times. Um, Julian's comments about the money is a really important one. And actually it's really good that in the UK money is nothing like as big a factor as it is in the US. Um, the rules are massively broken and there are all sorts of holes as you may have seen with parties saying if we can just bring lots and lots of £500 amounts in from Russia they don't count, which is probably technically correct but you know, clearly a hole. Um, but the amount you can spend promoting a particular candidate in a seat is about 13, 14, 15,000 pounds. That's not very much, which A means you don't have to raise millions of pounds, which they do in the US, but B means you're massively reliant on volunteers, which is why there's a huge effort to try to get people to volunteer and do things because there's no other way of doing it. You can't just show up with a massive checkbook, fight a seat, because you spend your 15 grand and you're done. Um, we have problems that, I think the other big problem that we have now is, is the polarisation problem. Um, and I recently had a paper accepted with, with a friend of mine who runs the depolarisation project in Stanford. And it started off saying, what are the problems with polarisation? 
can we come up with certain nice models for what, source, what solutions might look like? And it started quite optimistic, and by the time we finished it, it ended up concluding that we may have gone irreversibly beyond the point where you cannot depolarise without some sort of utterly massive crisis. Um, I'll, I'm trying to resist the urge to sketch some graphs behind me. Um, but part of the problem is because we're now, once people separate enough, it's very hard to know how people ever get back. If you were to read a strongly Remain document and a strongly Brexit document, regardless of where you are, you will think one is honest and the other is a pack of lies. And what we know is that even if you read both of them, the one you didn't believe, you go further away from it. You polarise more when you read all of that information. The forces that pull us apart have been accelerated. Some of that's technology, some of that's social media. It's the speed of things. And the restoring forces, which were largely chatting to people who thought, saw things differently to you, because you worked with them or you lived with them or you saw them in the pub, are getting much, much weaker. And unfortunately, the modelling suggests that we may be in the stage where there's now just two camps on so many issues. And that if you, you, know, if you read sites in the US, there are just completely diametrically opposed positions and almost no way of moving it. 60, a poll a few days ago found that 61% of Trump supporters said there was nothing he could do that would stop them voting for, for him. Um, and somebody was asked, what about if he shot somebody? I said, well, he presumably have a reason for doing that. Now, whatever your political affiliation, I suspect if you found out your preferred candidate had randomly shot somebody, you might rethink. But, but we're, we're drifting beyond that. Yeah, thank you. And Julian, what are your thoughts on that? Have we yeah, ever had a free and fair election? I, I, mean, I, I don't know if we've ever had a free and fair election. I, I think there was more outright bribery and corruption um, in days gone by than there is now. I, 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 it, it's supposition, but um, I, I like to think now that that's, that's pretty rare nowadays. I think that there, that there is a lot of concern. To pick up a point that Julian made uh, earlier when he said that he, he, would, he would ban uh, micro-targeting, um, I think I would propose a different solution uh, to the problem, certainly in politics. Because so I think, again, you know, micro-targeting, there's always been targeting, advertising targets all the time. Politics has always used the tools of the advertising trade um, since <laughs> politics began. Um, and so I don't see micro-targeting as a bad thing per se, but um, what the solution that I would propose, because I do accept that, the, that, there's a, there's, that the invisibility of, uh, and the mystery of what you can't see uh, uh, on social media and on the internet because stuff has been targeted at other people, that creates fear. That creates concern, that creates anxiety, and that undermines democracy. And so what I would propose, the different solution, is that every campaign is forced to publish every ad that it puts out on its website so that anybody at any time can go and see all of the ads that they've put out. And I think that that would concern some of the ads that people saw, but reassure that they could see all of the ads. I mean, just say, I, mean, I think that's, that's part of it. Um, and Joseph Rantry Reform Trust has funded a thing called Who Targets Me? Has anybody come across Who Targets Me? It enables you to keep track of all the Facebook adverts that you get and build up a big database. It's very easy to download. It will really, really help us to know what is actually being pitched to who uh, and why. So you know, do think about that. They've done an amazing piece of work. Thank you, and it's really great to hear suggestions for actual solutions as well. Um, so, Paul, you're back with us. The question we're discussing at the moment is, has it ever been possible to have a free and fair election? Well, I think I suggested earlier that, that I'm not convinced it ever has, but it is possible to have democratic elections under situations of um, manipulation of power and influence. Um, so I, I still think, you know, a, 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 a rigged election can be a legitimate election. That's a funny thing to say, I suppose. But, uh, uh, I, I, because the reality is, you know, I believe in people at the end of the day. But the, I, I think the greatest threat to democracy today is Facebook. Uh, I'll be very frank about that. I think they're out of control. <coughs> a machine which is controlling and monopolizing a large part of the public square. They control 80% of the social messaging marketplace. They are moving through their algorithms and their product design uh, communication into private groups, which are very, very hard 
to monitor and make sure that this information spreads like wildfire. They are specifically uh, mandating and doubling down the possibility of uh, lying in ads on Facebook, um, uh, which I think is an uh, extraordinary overreach, which is probably going to lead to significant antitrust action against them. Uh, uh, and that is, you know, for me, the overreach of Facebook, the blindness of power, um, uh, in a similar way to the blindness of power of the people like in general Africa. Uh, specifically talking about Julian, but other people, um, uh, uh, you know, will, will lead to their doubt. Uh, it's not an accident that a number of the leading democratic uh, presidential candidates are called the very significant antitrust action against the Silicon Valley empires. Um, uh, so, yeah, and that would be good. We live in a world which uh, power and democracy are constantly in conflict, uh, but like I said, I'm an optimist. Thank you. Um, before we move on, Julian and Julian, do, you, do either of you have anything else that you'd like to add? I'll, I'll maybe pick up on, um, on Paul's point about Facebook, uh, which is that I agree with it. Um, but, th th we, but we have to you know, think about solutions. Uh, and the thing with Facebook is that there's a lot of pressure to break Facebook up. Um, because the, the negative side of that is is that you break up a platform where you know the, its very network effect is, is a large part of its value and it would be hugely difficult to do. You could maybe break up um, you know, uh, uh, WhatsApp and uh, Instagram from the main Facebook platform but beyond that you start to significantly um, affect the utility that, that people get from it. And, and suggesting more people should just get off Facebook I, I think is, is, is naive. It's, it's um, you know, for a large sections of community, um, Facebook leaving Facebook is equivalent to, to social exclusion, uh, and so we should recognise that it, it, it. We should recognise it for what it is, which is it's a public utility, and uh, there is value to us in having it being a monopoly. Uh, but therefore, it should be regulated like a utility in the same way that we regulate the water and the electric companies, um, and we severely restrict what it can and can't do. And if I can add to that, my view is that the majority share in Facebook, uh, there should be a Facebook operating company in every country, and the majority share in that uh, uh, Facebook operating company should rest with the users of Facebook in that country. I mean, so I, I, there's some really interesting ideas, and I, I have a lot of sympathy because I'm very sceptical of Facebook. I think it is utterly toxic. We had a, a talk uh, earlier in the year, last year, I can't remember which one it was, John, uh, with Siva Vadyanathan, who's written quite a lot about Facebook, and says that fundamentally, because of Facebook's desperate need to get attention, it is, it is the problem, that there is no resolution of that. Um, but I agree that if you just break it up, you lose those, those connection effects. I do want to see people in other countries. You can do some breakage, but you can't, you can't do as much as you might like. Um, and there can just be other platforms. You know, if you say, we don't like Facebook, let's get rid of that, there'll be something else that will be engineered in a very similar way. It's not, un unless we provide some other magic solution, we're not, not going to get there. So then the question is, how do you make that system actually work? Because at heart, I think this is really a problem of power. Um, uh, sort of my, my, my gut values, I guess, are about the fact that any over-concentration of power anywhere, in anybody or anything, is a problem. It doesn't matter whether it's a company, whether it's a state, whether it's an individual, it doesn't matter. If, if there's too much power, A, even if you don't mean to cause harm, you can cause harm accidentally because you're too big to be controlled. But you also do need to ask with any uh, particularly hereditary institution, even if a particular CEO or a particular leader uses their power only for good, how sure are you that the next one will and the one after that? You know, Zuckerberg may not even be the worst person we could have as CEO of Facebook. Can I very quickly add, I think there's a third element on, on that power theme uh, as well, which is the, it's the imbalance of power between the huge organisation and the individual which people feel really threatened by. Hey, thank you. We did have a closely related question. Um, is this technology simply the scapegoat for a fundamental pro problem with democracy? So with that kind of slant, um, maybe Paul, um, do you have anything to add there? I mean, <laughs> uh, my, my view is that we're all responsible uh, for whatever we have influence over uh, and for our own actions. And 
You know, I, I think that it is one of the things that I thought a lot about actually last year in the middle of all of this crisis was scapegoating dynamics. Um, in fact, Peter Thiel, who is uh, one of the original investors in Facebook uh, and one of the key people in Silicon Valley behind Trump, uh, who certainly helped in a lot of the campaign, uh, was a student of Ray Girard. Um, I hope you don't mind me making that any reference since I, I wanted to be a professor, but I don't have concentration span. Uh, Ray Girard, a French sociologist uh, who had a number of different theories about sociology and anthropology, uh, one of which was mimesis, which is, you know, you copy other people, and that's the core dynamic on which uh, Facebook is based, according to Thiel, but, um, but, but scapegoating is another key dynamic in society, so you identify somebody who you can throw out in order to cleanse the society. This is one of the dynamics in the thinking of democracies, actually, as well. Uh, and uh, it's a way for you all to make feel better about yourselves. Um, so, you know, Teal and, and his friends support anti immigration organisations to get rid of immigrants so that you feel better about yourself and not worry about capitalism. Uh, I think that there was a really interesting dynamic last year around the scapegoating of uh, both um, uh, Cambridge Analytica itself, actually, uh, because. Well, it was an egregious spender in in particular, uh, in my view, whether he was a liar or a, or a criminal was, was somewhere on that spectrum. Um, uh, uh, but reality is the biggest systemic problems that uh, sometimes got obscured uh, by that story, and people were keen to move on, and that's sort of Facebook, and you know, the, 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 the fundamental government structure and social contract around the internet has not really changed. Um, uh, and at the same time, you know, the, the, the desire that some people have to scapegoat individuals. Um, I think you, know, you, you, you can pull your own opinion about Ricky Kaiser or Julian Wheatman or various other people who are, who are saying things about what they have or haven't learned from their experience. Um, uh, but I think uh, some people start to obsess about individuals uh, and start to lose the bigger picture. Uh, and um, so I, I think we all need to be careful about that. The, the, the attraction of the scapegoating moment is like the false resolution at the end of the Shakespeare uh, romance play or, 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 or comedy or something. You, you just be, be careful about that, Anna, because we really want to tie it up tidily. But we, we have a big problem still that we need to solve. <laughs> and the fact that King Henry has been rolled up does not, um, should, should not conceal the fact that all of your data is still being rolled out in black market. Thank you. Um, do either of you have anything you'd like to add? I mean, I think I, I lose track of what I've already said, but yes, there are huge fundamental problems with our democracy and how it works. We've got a broken voting system which doesn't work very well. We've got huge polarisation. Uh, we've got massively over um, levels of influence of people with very, very large amounts of money, both by co direct contributions, by media control. You know, huge numbers of amounts of the press is owned by billionaires. So I think the Telegraph is for sale if you want to try and buy that from some of them. Uh, you know, we have we have the bias in the media. There's, there is a huge set of problems that we have at the moment. Now, we're not going to have all of those magically vanish. This is one part of a series of challenges. Um, I, have to say, I, am, I am still an optimist. Um, we're all saying we're optimists, even while being very, very critical. We've got through worse, and I think Julian was right to say that there have been more corrupt elections in the past. But we do have massive challenges. What we get out of elections, what we get out of the democratic process, um, is not exactly, to, to coin a phrase, the will of the people. Um, uh, I think I, I would say a resounding yes. There is a, there's a huge amount of scapegoating going on here. It's, it's not lost on me that uh, the use of social media for electoral campaigns was pioneered uh, by Obama in 2008 and 2012 uh, without a murmur from um, uh, anybody, but it was only when Donald Trump won the election that it became an outrageous use of social media. Um, but nevertheless, the fact that it is scapegoating doesn't take the issue away. Um, and there are issues here that we have to address, whether or not uh, 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 seeing them arose from scapegoating. Um, ironically, uh, it's social media itself which has, which has reinforced a culture of scapegoating as the mob can round on any issue or any individual or any company that, um, uh, that trends. 
Can I, just, I, mean, I, I agree with the sca scapegoating comments, absolutely. But I don't think it's quite fair to say that there is use of social media by political <coughs> campaigns and not use of social media by political campaigns. There are ways of using social media which are much, much more positive, which are sort of broadcasting things that are happening, and there are ways which are much, much more negative. Some of the stuff we saw earlier was not exactly touting why Trump was a good thing. You know, so you can use social media for good, and I think Obama's usage mostly was of that form, maybe an earlier, more naive version. Um, but there are huge differences in how you can use it and how you can abuse it. But, but, but what I would I also... I have some opinion on this. Uh, <laughs> Unlike us. <laughs> involved, in both cases, uh, including Chris Hughes, who was a Facebook founder who worked closely with the Obama campaign, uh, uh, to help out. Uh, it's very interesting that there's a specific thing the Obama campaign did in 2012, which was a little bit similar to what Ken Jarrett did. Um, they they spread the, the open graph, the, the Facebook API. Uh, they enabled their supporters uh, to directly contact their friends um, uh, to canvas them. Um, uh, that was consent based and it was about people contacting their friends. Um, uh, the director of analytics for uh, the Iran campaign in that year said that was the one thing she felt a bit quizzy about because Facebook had made it possible. <laughs> um, there's a radical difference between that, which was very kind of consent based and relational, and the thing that came to uh, and their partners and COVID and so forth did, which was basically to take a whole bunch of people's data without <laughs> any consent at all. Um, and then do all sorts of crazy stuff with it. And then there's on the next like to tell crazy Bond, James Bond stories about all of this, even if it didn't work, which it probably didn't. Um, which the film does make good. <laughs> okay. um, but um, for me, you know, all of this points back to the fundamental problem being Facebook. And this is why Chris used to now call me for antitrust action against Facebook, uh, the company that he co founded. Uh, because he's very aware of the extent to which the Frankenstein has grown out of all control. Can I um, uh, just respond to that, which is your point. You, you've, I think, conflated two points there. One's the use of social media, and one's a practice which has gone on in elections, um, certainly uh, for as long as I can remember, and particularly in American elections. Negative campaigning is often a part of people's campaigns. And if we say we're going to allow the use of social media, then for us then to restrict how politicians put their cases forward means that we're somehow interfering with the democratic process. I think we've got to be strong enough and robust enough to be able to accept that this is a new medium for communicating and if a campaign wants to go negative then people will judge them for that but to, 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 to block negative campaigning just because we find it uncomfortable I think starts to interfere with democracy. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move on slightly for now. So we're actually going to ask the next question down, um, which you've alluded to already, um, about Obama using Facebook to win elections, and that was not considered a problem. And now that Trump's used it, it's referred to as warfare. Um, so we've discussed some of that already, but the most, um, maybe the pressing point here is, is our view of whether this is ethical determined by who uses it? Um, Julian Hubbard? I mean, I think it, it, it's a really interesting question. I think uh, all of us instinctively, I think, know that our reactions things do depend a bit on who's saying it, who, who are the goodies, who are the baddies. Um, and again, there's been um, some very nice studies, I can't remember exactly who did them, um, asking people whether they agree or disagree with, with various proposals. And if you attach various people's names, I think it's been done in both the US and the UK, if you, you get massively different results. There are ideas that Democrats like unless you tell them it's a Republican idea and vice versa. Um, so we are all a bit like that. That if, if something works for our side, you know, people tend to be more relaxed about it. But it, I think there are also, on top of that, um, positions that you choose to do and, and not do. I mean, I, um, I'm obviously biased about my own actions, but there are things that I knew were legal to do in a campaigning sense. You know, one of the holes that we have at the moment is that sitting MPs can, at public expense, send vast numbers of letters to people who've ever contacted them about an issue, including right up to just before the election is called. Um, this is perfectly allowed. The public will pay for you to get lots of letters from your MP 
and you may notice wherever you are in the country, or not everywhere, but in lots of places, a sudden spike of these um, non-political letters from your MP just before the election is called. Um, I knew perfectly well that that was allowed and that lots of people did it and that I wasn't prepared to do it. Um, now, maybe I'd have won in 2015 if I had done it. But, um, and, and as I say, I'm biased because, of course, I judge my own actions differently to anyone else's. So I think you can try to control it. And it is a really useful thing. How would I, again, if you want to sort of mental step for yourself, how would I feel if this was being done by that person or that person? And if I feel it wouldn't be okay if they did it, like, why do I think it's okay for someone else? Paul, do you have anything to add there? Does our perception of this depend on who uses it? I think everyone... Uh, look, I'm somebody who worked some time with Steve Hilton, who is now on Fox News, uh, cleaning up Trump. Uh, who went and talked in great detail with uh, Brittany Kaiser, who spent some time in Israel with everybody from the Teflis to Hamas. Uh, I, I believe in understanding different points of view, uh, respecting everybody, even if I disagree with them absolutely fundamentally, uh, taking people's arguments at their strongest. Uh, I, I remember having an interesting discussion with Steve Hilton in 2016 about the relative merits of Bernie Sanders and Trump as outsider candidates. Uh, and. Um, I didn't think he was serious about Trump as he appears to be. Uh, but uh, look, look, I think um, part of the problem with uh, polarization, which is driven both by oligarchic control of uh, mainstream media and by social media, the two dynamics that collide with each other, uh, is that uh, it leads to people not making reasoned objective decisions. Uh, or kind of reasonable objective opinions, but just to see people out of uh, court uh, for trial reasons. And I think we all need to challenge our own assumptions and uh, look for the strength in our adversary's arguments. This uh, is you know, one reason why I, you know, I, 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 in many cases, like and respect Billy, uh, because he's prepared to have a conversation, uh, even if he might fundamentally disagree on many aspects of politics and uh, his own track. I mean, probably there's a reason why. Right? <laughs> uh, Need the other half of the conversation in the public square. Uh, and so that, that's my point. Thank you. And Julian? Um, uh, so, so, so I'm going to make a few points. Even though I raised the, the, um, uh, the issue of it was when Trump got elected that people objected versus when Obama, but actually I'm going to argue myself against myself a little bit because there were also an awful lot of other things going on. So the Russians getting involved in um, the American elections was going on. There was, you know, Trump is a particularly divisive figure and he won unexpectedly. Um, and if anybody's interested, I'll, I, 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 give you, I, I give you my impression of why that was from the data that we had. Also that Brexit came along and we were associated with Brexit uh, and, and you know, that result went the way people didn't expect it to go. So there was an awful lot of other things going on that raised concern and raised attention rather than just the fact that it was a Republican rather than a Democrat who got into the White House. Thank you. The next question, do you think it's better to limit the development of the technology or instead try to use it to deliver true information to society in a personalised way? Um, so maybe we can start uh, with Paul. <laughs> Who's going to decide what's true? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Uh, this is this stuff is you, you, you turn into Colin before you're careful. It's like, oh, the ring, the ring. Um, there's a lot of power in data, right? Uh, there's a lot of power in AI, and uh, there are plenty of people uh, who have been sucked into the more malign operations using data who wanted to do good with it. Um, I've just seen some of those stories, but I mean, think the individual is concerned. So I, I, I think, um, what do I think about this? I think, I think that Facebook had a motto. Uh, they've supposedly abandoned now, thank God, uh, which is move fast and break things. Uh, and the ethos implied in move fast and break things. 
uh, is uh, going to be a disaster for the world if it is, uh, is manifested uh, in the way in which technological acceleration is implemented over the coming period. Um, uh, I think that uh, that is a, a, the, the path we're on, I think. We're on the path where we are going to move fast and create more and more and more, more things until there is some kind of crisis, some kind of response. Like my view is 2016 was a canary at coal mine, which came before the moment of absolute apocalypse and disaster or, uh, on algorithmic uh, surveillance capitalism and, and manipulation. Uh, so yeah, just enough time to look back. Um, my own view is uh, it, there may be a case uh, over the next couple of years for us to perhaps on some fronts move a little bit more slowly uh, and or uh, to focus more on mending things and breaking things. Uh, because sometimes when you break something, you can't put it back together. And anyone who knows the history of the former Soviet Union uh, and what's happened since then should sort of reflect on the number of things that were broken, but then put it back together. Could but only in a very distorted and dangerous form where nothing is true and everything is possible. We're trying to deform ourselves to Russia. So I think um, uh, in some cases moving a little bit more slowly. Uh, reflecting uh, on the ethics and, and building in the ethics and, and the checks and what's the black mirror version of this, uh, and focusing more on mending than on breaking, uh, which is a particular attitude that some pros in Silicon Valley have towards this stuff. Um, it's good to see um, some diversity in the room, what I can see from, from here. Um, uh, but look, um, uh, ultimately, we do need technology. Uh, it's a tool, a double-edged sword, and it's a tool that can help us fix a lot of social problems. Uh, what we need is a set of social infrastructures, um, incentives, money, the role of government, civil society, and markets regulated properly, uh, to be able to start you know, building more than it destroys. Uh, and, and, and that's the challenge and opportunity for all of us. And I think innovation is going to be a big part of the solution. Paul, cool. actually, one quick question. Um, this is the second time you've mentioned changing incentives. Um, how would you propose doing that? Good question. Um, it's a really good question. I mean, there's, a, there's a question of individual incentives for people. Like, any data scientist in Cambridge will have been headhunted by people, or you'll have been to careers there. You have looked at the relative like, like, like trajectories that they all see as somebody who goes and works in Nokia for a hedge fund that, that trades algorithmically and hopefully the way which creates their own society. Uh, or, you know, and sort of value work with all this data, which is so exciting, um, versus, you know, going and working for the at best the government digital service or something. <laughs> Um, which has been gutted recently, as far as I went. Um, so, so um, my view is that uh, there are people thinking in a far safe way about uh, the way in which technology and government and private sector and civil society and academia can work together on social missions. Uh, one in particular, the work of Marianne Mazzucato, uh, the entrepreneurial stage at the Institute of UCL. Uh, where they're thinking about how do you organise society behind social missions in, in, in much the same way um, as was done in some of the great leaps forward in, in the past. So, um, and, and another thing is just like, let me give you a very concrete example of the way in which regulation can be a catalyst for the right kind of incentives and the right kind of innovation. Uh, Bell Labs, the, uh, and Bell, the, the, the telephone company in the US, um, their patents uh, were, through sort of antitrust action, the Federal Trade Commission, put into the public domain so that any company could then uh, use that intellectual property for you know, innovation uh, uh, and or for the public good. Uh, that was one of the key sparks behind some of the big leaps forward in DARPA, the internet, the company, all of these things. So, um, my, my view is always, you know, how do we ensure that the common good is, is um, incented and safeguarded and built to a purpose? I think that takes 
Um, uh, and it doesn't necessarily avoid any conclusion, but it doesn't, it's taken that, but that doesn't mean that other people in society or market shouldn't be doing the same. Um, but there's a role here for like, public morality, which is a really old fashioned concept, but one of the things I certainly can't uh, We somehow need to recover that, uh, and, and everybody has their own responsibility. And that's like, I encourage all of you to think about it. Is, what is the part of the child? Like, what do you think? Thank you. Back off your death. I'm done. Thank you. Um, so, a couple of specific questions before we wrap up with the election. Um, so, Julian Wheatland, this next question is for you. So, the question is how difficult, sorry, how different was it running in campaigns in the US or the UK compared to other countries that campaigns were run in before? Um, uh, so, first of all, we, we, we never ran a campaign in the UK, um, in, in spite of what you may have heard. Um, in, in, in the US, um, a very different. So, so we, had a, we did data analytics and we did digital, um, uh, micro-targeting, digital targeting in the US. Pretty much anywhere else in the world, we did what I'll call old style um, campaign management where we conducted surveys on the ground, we, tried, tried, we tried to identify homogeneous groups, we crafted group messages, but it wasn't data analytics and, um, uh, and the digital, and, and whilst there was digital advertising, it wasn't targeted. So you know, the US was, was unique in the sense that A, it was data rich and B, and B, it was, it was, it, th there was freedom for us to be able to use the data uh, in ways that um, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do in the UK or anywhere else in Europe. Can I, can I just ask, I've been Extremely ask quickly. Can you comment on the um, relationship between uh, Cambridge Analytica and the Conservative Party in the past, either directly or through subsidiaries or front operations? <laughs> So, um, SEL Elections was, was created in 2013. SEL Group, which was originally Strategic Communications Laboratories, was created in 2005. Um, so the work that you just spoke about to do with um, uh, 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 advising on strike breaking and such like was Nigel Oakes, not as part yeah. of SEL and predates uh, either of the two companies. Uh, the Conservative Party, um, we did go in and have conversations at central office about what we maybe could do with them and there was never any work that came from it. Uh, but I would separate from me personally, I've been active in the Conservative Party in a personal capacity. Thank you, and we'll move on. Um, <laughs> the time, that's all. Um, if I can unlock my phone. Um, because the next question we wanted to address to Julian Huppert, given that you've got a background in education and educating physicists, do we need to educate technologists about ethics, maybe even at the undergraduate level? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it's really important that we get out of this idea that people should only learn the discipline that they're nominally studying. It, you know, it, it does not make sense anymore. You, know, you can't say, look, I'm purely a data scientist. I don't know about anything else. Not interested in history, not interested in English. I don't do anything else. I just do this. It just doesn't work. Um, I've been teaching for a while um, a course for some of the nanoscientists. Uh, apologies to any of you who are in the audience. Sort of very, very basic semethics things. Um, it's, it's been an interesting experience. Um, I, I remember one person who really was a pure util utilitarian. Uh, many of you all know the trolley problem uh, and you know, the, the annoying versions of it. And it was somebody who, who was quite happy to push 900 people to their deaths to save the lives of 901 people because 901 was bigger than 900. 
Um, I mean, yes, that's true, but I think most of us would at least have some sort of moral qualms about doing so. Um, so I think we absolutely have to do those things. And I, I saw there was one of the other questions about the, um, that was listed about whether that's indoctrinating people. Actually, a good education and ethics is about how do you think about these problems. It's not saying this is where your correct line is, this is ethical, this is not ethical. But it's at least getting you to think. You know, what I found astonishing was how many of the neuroscientists, I mean, some were brilliant on this, don't get, don't get me wrong, but many of them, when I'd say, what are the ethical aspects of your work, would say, there is no ethical connection with my work whatsoever, has no consequences. You know, just at least thinking it through would be really, really important. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we can return to the most upvoted question of the evening, <laughs> oh, and um, just being asked by one of my co-organisers to mention that, of course, what you've been saying about trying to educate people and get people thinking is, of course, what we're hoping to stimulate here with a discussion about <laughs> um, ethical problems. Um, but yes, so we're going to return for the last question of the evening to the question of the election. So, of course, we do have an election coming up in a few weeks' time. Are we still vulnerable in the same way that we were in 2016? Um, are there any more protections in place? Um, so maybe... Could ask Julian first? Sure. Um, as I've said previously, I think that the use of data analytics and the use of micro-targeting in our election is, is not a threat at all. Um, the, 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 the use of the data is very heavily regulated. The budgets aren't available to do anything meaningful um, uh, with, uh, with micro-targeting uh, or, or, or digital advertising, although it will form part of a ground base um, for all the campaigns. Where we are at risk and remain uh, significantly at risk is through the actions of foreign actors. Uh, we know that the Russians uh, were active in the, um, uh, in the US elections. We also know the Chinese have developed similarly powerful capabilities and they've been active um, in the protests in Hong Kong uh, we can expect them to be active in our elections and their aim is not to get a, sing a particular candidate elected it is for us to lose faith in democracy and I think that's a risk Thank you, Paul As a gentleman I will not ask you to comment on the uh, role of his former ambassador Johnson Co. Uh, significant partners of the Chinese state, capitalist apparatus, um, who was the key uh, concert investor, as I understand it, in him or its uh, allies in, in, in elevated successive in America, which is now, in my view, from one of that. Um, uh, although I do know from somebody who worked quite closely with Johnson that uh, he, they were very interested in the data processing capabilities of him in America. Uh, but frankly, the Chinese state has its own AI guys. Um, uh, and I will step back and I will say um, I think that the, 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 the good news is uh, you can't run dark ads on Facebook anymore, uh, so there will be more scrutiny. The bad news is uh, many of the lower information voters um, uh, uh, will not pay any attention to any of that. Uh, will are at great risk of being um, uh, adversely influenced um, uh, and manipulated uh, by a variety of different actors, foreign and domestic. Uh, I think uh, Dominic Cummings, who I know, is, is, is a sort of dark genius at the sub. Uh, and uh, you know, the Russians getting very good at things like persona management, Saudi's very good at this, the Chinese are good at it, um, where they basically infiltrate Facebook groups and other kinds of closed uh, environments and, and start sowing uh, all kinds of dodgy uh, narratives and suggestions. Uh, so, you know, what, what's, what's the solution to this? Uh, the solution is for uh, human beings. Uh, all of you, <laughs> uh, to do what you can, to have real conversations with each other, um, to reflect on what is, what is actually accurate information, if you can use your skills in a small or large way, uh, to help support democracy or, or, or to balance the odds in this weird moment. Uh, I encourage you to do so. Um, 
everyone's just making a cool decision. I don't want to take anyone. <laughs> it's how they want what, what you should do in this election. But what I can tell you is, uh, currently, uh, unless uh, there is large scale or tactical voting by progressive voters, Boris Johnson's going to win the next election uh, and take the day out of the European Union. Uh, and that uh, one of the critical groups will be uh, people who voted for Labour in the past and voted for the referendum. Uh, they are currently leaning worryingly towards Boris Johnson. Uh, so that's those are the stakes. Uh, in my view, the country's on fire, uh, and this is an election that will define the next decade or more of our fate. And, uh, you know, I've got kids, my family's fate. Right? Uh, and so, you know, all good people should do whatever they can, that's what I would say. Thank you, and Julian. Um, I mean, look, yeah, we, we, we are vulnerable. I think that, that's been, been said out already. I think it is the foreign actors one, which is probably the single most scary. Uh, I mean, it could, it could be worse. We could have electronic uh, vote counting. We could have online voting. <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of ways in which we could make ourselves much more vulnerable. I hope the discussions around that won't go anywhere. And I think it's a great shame that there are people in significant positions, Dominic Cummings being mentioned, who would be quite happy to see utter chaos. They actually quite, quite enjoy that and so relax. And so we see this focus on voter ID, which is fixing not a problem rather than fixing any of the actual problems. Um, I don't want to make any sort of party political pitch. That's really not what I'm here for, though. I, I endorse the comments about tactical voting, keeping an eye on what's happening. What I would say is that the thing that possibly most upset me from, from watching the film earlier was what was happening in, in Trinidad and Tobago. And the idea of running massive campaigns to stop people from voting, you know, really upsets me. I'm up for people of all different persuasions trying to get people enthused for their side. You know, that, that's great. That's legit. But getting people to say, we're going to take a stance by not showing up, really upsets me. And there's a great line from the West Wing that decisions are made by those who show up. And if the people in this room don't show up, whatever your views then by definition it's the sort of people who don't show up on an evening to think about these things who do show up. And that strikes me as really bad. So it's not directly answering the question, but if I could say one thing to all of you, just whatever your political views, and I genuinely, for, the, for these purposes at least, don't care what they are, get involved. Everybody desperately needs help. All the parties are short of people going out and doing things. All the parties, if we're honest, are short of good candidates. There's huge elections coming up for the City Council next year. Um, around the country, get people to get involved. That's the strongest antidote. <laughs> so I think the main conclusions there from Paul and Julian were have meaningful conversations with people and get actively involved in political discussions and in politics itself. Um, at which point it seems a good place to wrap up the evening. Um, we will have one more poll, however, but let's thank our panel again.